Namaskaram. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about verse uh, 24 of uh, Upadeshunya to understand how this fits into the text uh, and about whole, whole text. Um, it's, it's useful to go through a summary of uh, the preceding verses. That is, um, in verses 1 to uh, 9, well, from verse, let's say verses 3 to 9, Bhagavan is talking about the path of, uh, of bhakti. And uh, the subsidiary limb of the path of bhakti, which is the path of karma, that is, uh, the, the preliminary stages of the uh, path of bhakti deal with um, deal with uh, entail karma, doing action by mind, speech, or body, puja, japa, and dhyana. Uh, so that is, if those actions are done without desire for any fruit, but just for the love of God, that is what is called karma yoga, um, which is the preliminary stages of the path of bhakti. That is, Bhagavan doesn't take karma yoga to be a separate path, but the earlier stages of the path of bhakti. So one progresses through those state, the, the various practices of, of bhakti, uh, puja, japa, and dhyana. And then Bhagavan says in verse 8, but of all the, um, of all the uh, practices of bhakti, rather than considering uh, God to be something other than oneself, taking God to be nothing other than oneself, meditating on God is nothing other than oneself. In other words, meditating on only I, that is of all the best. And by that um, strength of that meditation, uh, of uh, meditating only on I, um, with the conviction that that is God, uh, that God is what is shining in our heart as I, by, by the strength of that meditation, one remains in the state of being, which transcends all uh, meditation in the form of mental, in the form of mental activity, and uh, that is the supreme devotion, that is Parabhakti. Then in verse 10, he, he summarizes that by all the four paths, karma, bhakti, yoga, and jnana, by saying that subsiding and being in one source, the place from which one rose, that is uh, karma, bhakti, yoga, and jnana. Then verses 11 to 15, he deals with the path of, uh, of yoga and shows how um, just like the path of bhakti must eventually merge into the path of jnana by uh, coming to the understanding that God is what shines in our heart as I. In the path of yoga, having, having, um, having uh, brought about a partial subsidence of mind by means of pranayama, rather than allowing the mind to subside in layer, one should, one should direct the path on the, uh, the mind on the one path of, of investigation, in other words, the path of self-investigation, and then only will it die, he says in verse 14. And um, then in verse 15, he says, for the great yogi whose mind is, who has attained his nature and whose mind is dead, there is no action uh, 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 um, remaining. Um, then the real uh, Bhagavan begins to deal with the heart of his own teachings from verse 16 onwards, that's the path of jnana, um, which the other paths uh, must lead to. So in verse 16, he says, um, he defines what is real awareness, that is being aware of anything other than ourself is not real awareness. So what he says is, um, uh, 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 leaving all external objects. That means leaving, ceasing to be aware of external objects or ceasing to attend to external objects. The mind investigating and knowing its own form of light, that is real awareness. So only when the mind is turned away from all objects, back towards its own light, its, its, its form of light, as he says. That means it's, it's fundamental awareness I am. When the mind knows only its fundamental awareness, I am, that is real awareness. So Bhagavan, in a way, is just summarizing here what is the, what both the, the path and the goal. That is, the goal is just to be aware of ourself alone, and the means is to withdraw the mind from everything else and to attend only to ourself. Then in verse 17, he says that if one investigates the mind without forgetfulness, 
it will be clear there's no such thing as mind at all. This is the direct path for all. Um, here, what, what he talks about here is the form of the mind. Is, um, he, he's referring here to ego, which is the essence of the mind. As he clarifies in the uh, next uh, verse, verse 18, where he says, the mind is, is often used as a, as a, as a, um, as a collective name for the totality of all thoughts. Of all thoughts, the root is the first thought, I, the thought called I. Um, it, that's a, a number, that means ego. Therefore, the, what the mind essentially is, is only this first thought, I, in other words, ego. Um, so that is a, he, he clarifies there what is, what is the, we have to investigate the form of the mind and the form of the mind is, the essential form of the mind is only ego. Um, uh, and then in verse um, 19, he says, when, when we investigate what this, uh, from, from what this ego rises, it will die. From what does ego rise? It rises only from our own real nature. That is the pure awareness I am. Ego is the false awareness I am this body. From where did this false awareness arise? It cannot arise from anywhere other than the, the real awareness I am. That's a pure awareness I am. That's what we actually are. So ego rises only from ourself. It does, cannot rise from anywhere else. So when we investigate the, uh, the place from uh, where ego rises, that means if we investigate uh, our fundamental awareness I am, ego will thereby die. Verse 20, he says that when ego dies, in the place where I merges, uh, that the one appears spontaneously as I am I. That itself is the whole. Um, that is, when ego um, merges back in its source, what remains is only the pure awareness I am. And the pure awareness, whereas ego is the false awareness, I am this body, or I am this or I am that, as Bhagavan often said, is ego. But our real nature, our real identity is only I am I. That is, I am nothing other than I. So often in older texts, uh, the, the final uh, experience, the final uh, clarity that dawns is that I am Brahman or I am that. Bhagavan clarifies, that actually the final experience is only I am I. There's no other, there's nothing other than I, but I could for I to identify with. There's only I am I. So I is nothing but I. We are nothing other than ourselves. So we need not bring in any other concepts such as Brahman or God or anything. The final experience is there is only I and nothing but I. So I am only I. Um, and then, um, so in all these verses, he's, he's in verse... Um, in verse 18, he clarified that what the mind essentially is, is only I, in the sense of ego. Uh, ego means the, the adjunct mixed uh, I, in other words, I am, I am this or I am that. In verse 19, he said that when we investigate this I, the, the place from, uh, from uh, we investigate within, what is the place from which one rises as I, I will die. This is uh, jnana vichara, awareness investigation. Uh, then when this I merges, what then shines forth as I am only I, that is the uh, infinite whole. Um, and then in verse 21, he says that referring to the infinite whole that appeared as, that shines forth as I am I, that is at all times the substance of a true import of the word called I because of the exclusion of our non-existence in sleep, which is devoid of I. That is, though ego is absent in sleep, we don't cease to exist in sleep. So what we actually are is only that fundamental awareness I am, which is the infinite whole that shines forth as I am I. Um, and then in verse 22, he he's he um He's, uh, he, uh, since, since the true import of the word I is only that infinite whole, 
Then what do we have to infer from this? Since for, till now we've been taking these five sheaths, a body consisting of five sheaths, namely uh, a physical body, um, life, mind, intellect, and uh, uh, will. Uh, since these uh, five are all jada and asat, jada means they're not aware, asat means they don't actually exist, they are not I, which is Sat. Sat means what actually exists. So um, that is, I is both Sat and Chit, where the, these five sheaths are all Jada and Asat. Why are they Jada? Because they're objects known by us. Even, that is, the body, phys this physical body is an object known by us. The life that animates it is an object known by us. The mind, in the sense of all the gross functions of the mind, is object known by us. The intellect and all its functionings are objects known by us. The will and all its uh, um, vasanas, which give rise to likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on, they are all objects, things known by us. Whereas we are awareness and what actually exists. So they are not, since, since they are all jada and asat, uh, they are not I, which is Sat. Um, and then in verse 23, so if we are not any of these five bodies, of these five sheaths, then what are we? Everyone explains very nicely in verse 23, which we dealt with last time. Ulladu unara unavu verin mayin, ulladu unavahum undipara, unavay. Namai ulam undipara. Because of the non existence of any awareness other than what exists, to be aware of what exists, what exists is awareness. And awareness alone exists as we. That is, what we actually are is, is only uh, awareness, which is what actually exists, Uludu. That is the term, uh, Uludu is a Tamil term, which means what exists. It implies the same as the word that he used in the previous verse, sat. Sat, sat means what, ex what actually exists, it implies what actually exists, really, what is actually real. Um, and uh, unavu is uh, uh, awareness. Where in the previous verse, he didn't mention unavu, but he implied unavu when he said that the, uh, since the uh, five sheaths are jada and the sat, they are not I, which is sat. Uh, we have to insert which is sat and chit. Chit is the opposite of jada, uh, which is what he refers to here as unavu. Um, so Bhagavan's conclusion is that, that we alone are what actually exists, and we uh, uh, what we actually are is awareness. N now we come to verse twenty-four, which he's dealing with now. This is in a sense a continuation of what he's been saying in the preceding verses, but it also ties back to what he said in verse 8. As I said, in verse 8, what Bhagavan said was, um, rather than Anya Baba, an Anya Baba in which he is I, is the best among all. Um, that is all the verses up to verse 8. It's, he, that is from verses um, 3 to 8. He's talking about the Bhakti Marga. And uh, up to verse 7, it's Anya Bhava. Anya Bhava means taking God to be something other than ourselves and meditating on him as if he's something other than ourselves. In other words, taking God to be a name and form. Um, it's, 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 but in verse 8, he says, better rather than taking the meditating on God as if he was something other than ourselves. In other words, that's what that's the implication of Anya Baba means uh, meditating on God as something other than ourselves. Certainly Ananya Baba. Uh, Ananya Baba means meditation on what is not other. Not, what is not other means what, what is not other other than other here implies other than oneself. What is not other than oneself? Only oneself. And then he uh, he, he, he clarifies what is meant by an Anya Baba, Avana Hamahum, in which he is I. He here me is, refer Avan is referring to God. So with, with the firm conviction that God is I, meditating only on I is the best among all. So this is, after this verse, Bhagavan didn't directly mention God at all. 
That is, he mentioned God here not by name, but by the word Avon, he refers to God. Um, indirectly, he's, he's, God is implied in the next verse because Bhagavan talks about parabhakti. That means the, so when Bhagavan says parabhakti, that's supreme devotion, it implies supreme devotion to God. What is supreme devotion to God? By the strength of that Ananya Bhava, by the strength of, of that meditation on nothing other than I, being in Sat Bhava, that's the state of being, which transcends all bhavana, all thinking or imagination or meditation on things other than ourselves, that alone is Parabhakti Tattva, that alone is the nature or reality of supreme devotion. But as I say, the last verse in which he explicitly refers to God is verse 8. So in verse um, 24, he's tie, he's linking back to that. And he, so in verse 8, he said, God is be meditating on I with the conviction that God is I. So in what sense is it true to say that God is I? That is what uh, Bhagavan clarifies in verse 24. Um, what he says is, Irakum ekayal isa ji vergal oruporleyava undipara upadi unube verundipara. What that means is, irakum ekayal means by existing nature. That is by in their that implies in their uh, in their real nature, which is just uh, um, being. Uh, in other words, uh, they uh, uludu. Um, uh, in, in their real nature, uh, God and soul are just one substance. The word he uses for substance here is poro. Poro is a, a Tamil word that is, um, means more or less the same as the Sanskrit uh, word vastu. That is, it's the, the, the meaning of poro. Um, has to be understood according to a context. In some contexts, poral can mean an object or anything is a poral. That's in some context. But in a philosophical sense, poral or vastu are used in the sense of substance. For example, um, if you have gold ornaments, the ornaments are mere forms. The substance is gold. So substance there, uh, the, the term that would be used in in Tamil is either vastu, which is a Sanskrit term, or poro, which is a Tamil term. Uh, so, the, the, so here Bhagavan is using poro in the sense of substance. Okay? But what the substance means? What they essentially are, God and soul, are just one substance. Um, what is that one substance? They're irikumike, their nature of mere being, and being, as he clarified in. Um, in the previous verse, uh, is nothing but awareness, because what actually exists is only awareness. So awareness and, and, and being are one and the same thing, sat and chit are one. So uh, in their essential nature as sat, God and, and, and soul are one thing, are one substance, um, only one substance, or uporle, a gives a sense of only. Um, here, Bhagavan uses the, the term he uses for God and soul is Isa Jiva Gal. Um, the, the Gal is, a, is the uh, plural ending. But it, so it could be taken here that he is saying God and souls, souls in plural. Um, but we need not take it like that. He's that we can take it, um, but uh, that is the when, a, when, Two, two or more terms are added to, uh, joined together in a compound, um, as in Isa Jiva Gal, uh, it is auto automatically becomes uh, plural. We can see that, for example, in, in Nana, in paragraph uh, seven of Nana, uh, what, uh, in, in the first sentence, Bhagavan says, what actually exists is only Atmaswarupa. Then in the next sentence, he says, the world, soul, and God uh, uh, that is their fabrications in it, like, like the loosely silver in a, uh, a shell. The term he uses there for the world, soul, and God is 
Jaga 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 Jiba Ishwaragal. Here, when he says the plural termination is added to the word Ishwara, that doesn't mean he's talking about gods here. He's not talking about a god in plural, because they, he's talking about three things the world, the soul, and God. So it becomes a plural. Uh, as when when the, the three are expressed as a compound, in exactly the same way here in verse 23, when he says Isha Ji Virgal, he's not, we, 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 no, we could interpret it as meaning souls, there's no need to uh, take it as a plural here, we can take it as singular, because um, according to Bhagavan, uh, that is the, the essence of Bhagavan's teaching is that there's only one ego. And what is called jiva is nothing but ego. So there is only one jiva. This is what is called eka jiva vada, contention, but there's only one jiva. This is what Bhagavan taught because this is the most useful attitude to have if we want to go uh, deep within, uh, deep in this path of self investigation. Um, so that is why I translated each. Uh, Isa G. Bergal, not as God and souls, but as God and soul. Um, so we have two things. We seemingly have two things, God and soul, but actually, in their essential nature, they are just one substance. Then how do they seem different? Uh, Bhagavan clarifies that in the next sentence. Upadi unave verundi para. Only adjunct awareness is different. That is... Um, uh, the jiva here means ego. Ego is always is that false awareness that is always aware of itself as I am this body, in which the term body, as Bhagavan clarified elsewhere, uh, is a form of five sheets. In other words, what Bhagavan means when he says ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body, is he's not just referring to a physical body, but to all the five sheets. Uh, uh, um, uh, physical body, uh, life, mind, intellect, and will. Because when we experience a body as I, we experience all these five collectively as I. Because we never experience a dead body as I. It's always a living body. So automatically, the, uh, along with the body, we experience the prana, the life. And we also never experience a sleeping body as I. It's always a body that seems to be awake. So in a waking body, there's also mind, intellect, and will are all uh, functioning. So all these five collectively we experience as I. Um, so that uh, uh, full that awareness, I am this body. That is that 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 awareness which is aware of itself as I am this body. That is the ego or, or soul. Um, but. Uh, the, what, that is the I am this body is an identification. The, exist, the existing nature, what he refers to as irakumiyakeal, is the only the I am portion of I am this body. That I am portion is our nature of just being, and that is the, is one that that God is nothing but that I am. So the. Uh, Body or, or, uh, is an adjunct. The body consisting of these five sheaves is an adjunct. Uh, so that is what distinguishes us from God. If we remain just as I am, there is no difference between ourselves and God. When we rise as ego, we uh, 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 erroneous, erroneously aware of ourselves as I am this body, and consequently we seem to be different from God. Um, the two terms, uh, that, that, the, the, the last sentence consists of just three words, upadi, unave, veru. Um, upadi means adjunct, it's a Sanskrit word. Unave is an intensified form of unavu, uh, it, so it means uh, awareness, or, or only awareness, or awareness alone, and veru means different. Um, upadi unavu, I take it here, and I, I think this is the, 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 the more correct way to take it, is, uh, is upadi unabu is a, is a compound, meaning adjunct awareness. 
Um, some people translate this or interpret this to mean uh, uh, upadi and unavu, that is uh, adjuncts and awareness, or adjuncts and unavu can also mean knowledge. So adjunct and knowledge, it's only there, adjuncts and knowledge, but uh, that is different. That is how it's interpreted by some people. In Sanskrit, the term Bhagavan uses is um, Vesha D. Uh, Vesha means uh, um, um, disguise or the, the costume, like, a, like a, an actor on a stage wears a costume, that is Vesha. Um, Vesha can also mean a uniform or whatever, but it, it, it's, it implies what, 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 we, what is covering us, what is concealing our identity. And D means, uh, in that context, well, D can, can mean intellect, but in that context, it means awareness. Um, so Vesha D means, uh, like Upadi Unru, means adjunct awareness. In, when Bhagavan translated it, this is in Malayalam, because he uh, translated it in a longer meter, he translated it as upadium uh, unavum, which seems to imply upadi and unavum. Um, but sometimes um can be added in poetry um, as, a, as a poetic expletive, so it doesn't actually have any meaning. Um, but some people will say, no, 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 Bhagavan has clearly indicated Malayalam, but uh, he's talking about two things here, Upadi and Unavu. If people insist on that interpretation, it's, it's, not, it's not wholly wrong, because, uh, but it is, it's an unnecessary interpretation, because according to Bhagavan, not, the upadis, adjuncts, are all objects. Objects do not exist independent of our perception or awareness of them. So adjuncts and our awareness of them are one and the same thing. That is, this body, mind, intellect, and so on, uh, they don't exist independent of our awareness of them. So um, uh, to take it as, if we take it as upadi unavu, uh, Adjunct awareness is the same as adjunct. If we take it as um, adjunct and awareness or adjunct and knowledge, all that everything as jiva, whatever knowledge we have, is we are aware of it is I know this. Because it, that is something added to, uh, that is something superimposed upon the fundamental awareness I am, instead of being aware of ourselves just as I am, we're aware of ourselves as I am knowing this, I am knowing that. So, uh, whatever knowledge we have of anything other than ourselves is in a sense an adjunct. So, um, it really, it's, um, it, it doesn't substantially change the meaning, even if you, even in, if people insist that Bhagavan's talking about two things here, it has, it doesn't, change the, the, the essential meaning here. The, the basic meaning, simple meaning is uh, what, what, is, uh, what distinguishes God, the soul from God is uh, awareness of adjuncts or adjunct awareness. Um, this adjunct awareness, who is aware of adjuncts? Uh, Jiva is aware of adjuncts. Jiva is aware of itself as I am this, uh, I am this body. Is God aware of adjuncts? No. Uh, that is, from, from the perspective of the jiva, it may seem that God is aware of adjuncts. Because God, God is, in our belief, God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving. So these are, these are, uh, the attributes, these are attributes that we, uh, this is what, attributes that we, uh, give, we attribute to God. But all these are true only in our view. In the view of God, what God is aware of and what God loves and what is just I am, because God is nothing but I am. So the, the, whatever adjuncts God may seem to have exist only in the view of Jiva. In God's view, what exists is only I am. Um, <coughs> because because God is, is that I am, and as, as Bhagavan said in um, that verse uh, 
seven of uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, seven paragraph of, of Nana, but I referred to earlier. Bhagavan begins that paragraph by saying, Yatatamai Uladu Atmasurupa Mondre. What actually exists is only Atmasurupa. So God is nothing but that Atmasurupa. It's only in our view that God has, um, that God seems to have uh, adjuncts. Um, uh, uh, so um, I'll just quickly, I'll, I'll discuss it in more detail next time, but. They, um, this verse is, is um, it's put, as I say, it's partly to connect back to um, the earlier verses where Bhagavan talks about where, where God is nothing other than soul. It's partly that God is nothing other than I. It's partly to explain that. But it's also to lead on to the next verse in which Bhagavan says, since the difference between ourself and God is only the adjuncts, He's, uh, um, what he says in the next verse is, um, knowing oneself without adjuncts is itself knowing God, because God is, uh, uh, because of shining as oneself, it's what it means. It implies because uh, God always shines as oneself, that God is nothing but our own self. Our, 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 what we actually are is God. Um, so if we know ourselves without adjuncts, that itself is knowing God. So it's to come to lead to that conclusion, the Bhagavan, um, uh, that's the, the, what Bhagavan is leading to in this verse 24. Um, so, so far I've discussed what is the, uh, the meaning of this verse, but always with Bhagavan's verses, we have to see not only the meaning, we also have to try to understand the implications of that meaning. So here Bhagavan is saying, what distinguishes the soul from God is only adjuncts. The soul, as he clarified elsewhere, that jiva is nothing but ego. For example, in verse um, 24 of Uludhunapadu, he, he says, um, the body does not say I, implying that the body is not aware of itself as I, because uh, he says, jada udul nana nadu, but the, the, the jada body does not say I. Yeah, the implication is that uh, because the body is jada, because it's not aware, it's not aware of itself as I. Satchit udiyadu, satchit doesn't rise. But between these two, uh, um, one thing called I rises as the extent of a body. And this is um, Chit Jadagranti, uh, um, Bandham, bondage, uh, Jeevan, uh, the, the soul, uh, uh, Nupame, the subtle body, um, um, Ahande, ego, Ichamsaram, this samsara, and uh, Manam, mind. So, there, Bhagavan clearly clearly indicates that the word jiva refers to nothing but ego, the false, uh, uh, the false awareness of ourself as I am this body. So, um, so what he refers to here as soul is ego, and what he refers to as God is our real nature, what we actually are. So what is it that distinguishes ego from our real nature is only adjuncts. That is, our real nature is just that, is just pure awareness, which is our, our, fun, our fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is our real nature. That is God. Ego is nothing but that same I am mixed with adjuncts. Mixed with adjunct awareness, we can say, that is, instead of being aware of ourselves as just I am, we're aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that, this body, uh, in other words. Um, so uh, uh, the only distinction between uh, ego and uh, our real nature is the adjuncts that, uh, with, that ego ex experiences as itself. So if we remove all adjuncts uh, from ego, ego remains just as I am. So what? So why this is important? People often, because Bhagavan talks about 
our real nature, and he talks about um, um, ego, people uh, quickly jump to the conclusion that there are two eyes. For example, if we go back to um, verse 21, what Bhagavan said in verse 21 is that, um, referring to the previous verse in which he talked about the infinite, uh, infinite whole that uh, uh, shines forth as I am I, he says, that is at all times the substance of the world called I. Because of the exclusion of our non-existence, even in sleep, which is devoid of I. So he's talking about something that is always the import of the word I, and he's talking about some other I that is absent in sleep. So people, quick, people who have superficial understanding of Bhagavan's teaching, they quickly jump to the conclusion, oh, there are two eyes. There's a real eye and a false eye, a big eye and a small eye. Uh, um, um, a paramatma and a jivatma, as if there are two things. No, there is only one eye. That one eye in its pure condition is our real nature. That is, uh, uh, in its pure condition means when, when we are aware of ourselves as just I am, that is a, our real nature. When instead of being aware of ourselves as just I am, we are aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that, that is ego. So ego is nothing but the pure awareness mixed and conflated with adjuncts. So this is uh, uh, um, another uh, inference, I mean, another implication of what Bhagavan is teaching us in verse 24. Though he's not using those terms, he's talking about God and soul. Uh, as I say, God refers to our real nature. Um, God is nothing but our real nature, and soul is nothing but ego. So the only distinction between our real nature and ego is uh, is the uh, is the adjunct with which e that ego mistakes to be itself. So the I am in its pure condition is God or our real nature. I am mixed and conflated with adjuncts is ego. So that that is. Um, this has implications as far as the practice of self-investigation is concerned, because people often often used to ask Bhagavan, in, in uh, who am I? Is the I we should investigate? Is it is it our, is it Atman or is it ego? At, by Atman they mean uh, our real nature. Um, Bhagavan often used to say, "Oh, it's ego." Why he said that? Because the, the fact. That people ask such question shows that they are, they don't understand the oneness of um, of ego and our real nature. Jiva Brahmaikya. That is, uh, Jiva Brahmaikya. Jiva means uh, ego. Brahma means our real nature. Aikya means oneness. So, our real nature and ego are one and the same thing. The only difference is the adjuncts. So. When we're investigating who am I, it doesn't matter whether we say this I is uh, is um, Brahman or whether we say this I is ego, because there's only one I. If we investigate this one I, but now seems to be ego, we will find that it is nothing but Brahman, uh, nothing but our, our own real nature. Um, just like if if we uh, if if we see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, if we are advised, no, look at it carefully, it's not a snake, it's only a rope. If we look carefully at what seems to be a snake, we find it's only a rope. Likewise, if we look, if we uh, keenly investigate what seems to be ego, we will find it is nothing but our real nature, because ego is nothing but our real nature. It's just that when we rise as ego, we mix and conflate ourselves with adjuncts. Um, so we, we, we mistake ourselves to be adjuncts. But if we look at just the essential I, I am portion of ego, the adjuncts will slip off because the adjuncts seem to exist only so long as we attend to them. If we attend only to I am, we thereby withdraw our attention from the adjuncts. The adjuncts recede into the background of our awareness and eventually um, if we attend to ourselves keenly enough, we cease to be aware of any adjuncts of anything other than ourselves. Then what remains is just that pure I am, 
which is the, which is our real nature, what we were all along. So ego and our real nature are not two different eyes. It's the same eye. Ego is mixed with adjuncts. Our real nature is devoid of adjuncts. That's all the difference. But the eye is one. Eye is always one. There's never, there's never more than one eye. So like this, from, from every verse of Bhagavan, we, we need to, first we need to understand the, um, the direct, what, what Bhagavan is saying directly in the verse, but then we also have to think deeply about it and understand the implications of this. And of course, the implications, we have to understand the implications in the light of all of Bhagavan's other teachings. We shouldn't start trying to um, draw our own inferences uh, from his verses without being guided by all his other uh, verses, because um, in anything, uh, can, any words can be misinterpreted. We, we, can, we can give a wrong interpretation to any word. So to be sure that our interpretation, our understanding of the verses is correct, whatever inferences we draw from any verse should be uh, firmly rooted in Bhagavan's teachings as a whole, because all of Bhagavan's teachings are, are, are very closely uh, interconnected. They're all closely, um, they're all coherent, they're all tied together. So um, what he says in one verse, if we compare it with what he says in other places, we can draw so many very useful, practical and deep implications. But we, we shouldn't uh, draw implications that are not in accordance with his teachings as a whole. Um, I think that was all I had to explain about this verse. Um, other things may come to um, my mind later, but anyway, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, please, um, particularly questions pertaining to this verse, please ask. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was nice. At one point, I, I, I didn't um, absorb before, and that is um, the, the Seaver Hurl. He's a Sivarhal, and the Sivarhal yeah. is actually um, singular rather than plural, and that makes more sense, you know, particularly in the context of the subsequent verses. Yes. You know, the whole thing together, it, it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, and I was looking at um, the Upalese Undir of Bhagavan Sri Ramana, um, the book published by um, Arunachala Ramana Book Trust. Yes. And there it, it's translated as in the plural form, I guess we, can, we need to change that in the subsequent editions. No, well, right. yeah, and it, it's Sadwam often when he explained things, he would start off giving the more superficial explanations. Right. And only when we question him more deeply will he give the deeper explanations. So um, in many of his commentaries, the su more superficial explanations are not wrong. But they're useful for people at a certain stage, but we, we, we should always be going deeper and deeper and deeper. Right. I, I found with Sadhuam, the more I questioned him, I'm mean, not just, not just random question, but, um, questions relevant to Bhagavan teachings, they, they get more and more clarity, the more, uh, the more deep, the, the deeper my question, the deeper the answers I got. And I'm sure it was exactly the same with Bhagavan. Often Bhagavan would give relatively superficial answers in order to suit the level at which people were. Only to people like uh, Murugana and Shiva Prakash and Pillai and such people who were really going deep into their subject would Bhagavan give the deeper answers. We can see this, for example, in Lakshmana Sharma's commentary on Uludu Napadu. That is a very um, valuable commentary because Lakshman Sharma repeatedly asked Bhagavan to explain the verses to him. So Bhagavan had, had painstakingly uh, explained the verses to Shiva Prash and Pillai. But, I mean, to Lakshman Sharma. And Lakshman Sharma, what he learned from Bhagavan, he wrote in his commentary. But we can see that some of the explanations that Shiva Prakash and Pillai gives there are not the deeper explanations. So Bhagavan gave him explanations at a level that was suitable to his level of understanding. Uh, for example, he, he Lakshman Sharma had studied um, 
uh, Sanskrit, and he'd also studied um, uh, Vedanta in Sanskrit. So he was familiar with the Upanishads and things. So um, uh, he was, he was, he, because he was familiar with more traditional ways of explain of understanding things, some of the explanations Bhagavan gave were more at that level. Uh, for example, I don't have a book with me here, but um, in his, um, with regard to verse five of um, of uh, Uludunapadu, um, uh, where Bhagavan says, um, uh, Udul Panchakos Udul, the body is a form of five sheaves. Therefore, all five are contain, uh, uh, included in the term body. The, the, from the more traditional, uh, from the perspective of more traditional Vedanta, we in in the waking state, the body we experience is the is the stula sarira, in other words, the physical body. In dream, we experience the sukshma sarira, the, the subtle body, and in sleep, it's the karana sarira. And according to the when we experience the physical body, as I we experience a uh, a physical, a stool of world. And when we experience a sukshma body, we experience a, a sukshma world. Bhagavan actually has explained this is, this is not actually uh, correct because uh, the body, we, when we're dreaming, whatever body we experience as I in a dream is, um, um, is, uh, <coughs> is, 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 seems at that time to be just as physical as whatever body we now experience as I. It's only from the perspective of the waking state that we say, oh, this is a, this is a physical world, this is a physical body. What we experienced in, in dream was just uh, mental. It's only from the perspective of waking state that we say that. When we're dreaming, the world we experience then is just a, seems to be just as physical as this world seems to be. So Bhagavan said there's no difference between waking and dream. But um, Lakshman Sharma, he, he gave more, his, I can't remember exactly the details of what he says, but it seems to be more veering towards the, um, the more uh, traditional understanding of the five sheaths, whereas what Bhagavan meant in that, in, um, in that uh, verse five, is that all whenever we experience a body as I, we're experiencing all the five sheaths. That's why he said all five are included in the term body. So there are different levels of different levels of explanation. Even Bhagavan gave different levels of explanation suited to the understanding, to the level of understanding of whoever he was talking to. That makes sense. Um... So Thank we need not change what Sadhuam has done because, <laughs> uh, because uh, I mean, he, I mean, he, he did, for people who didn't question so deeply, he would, um, he would uh, give, he would explain it in that way. But if we question more deeply, then he would give uh, deeper explanations. Well, now it's on record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I also was wondering, that first part of this verse, um, uh, irukkum irkayal isa sivargalum oru porale ava. I think that's a, it's an Advaitic statement. Yes, basically it's saying pure, 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 pure Advaitic statement. It, it, so all it's is one. basically saying jiva brahmaikya. Exactly. It's just it's all is one. Yeah. Um, and then, I, I don't know, maybe I'm looking at this too much. Um, the, the positioning of that statement at verse 24, um, is there any significance here? Like, why would Bhagwan put it at this location? Um, mm. And as it is, he is he trying to imply that it's it's more an experience rather than just a theoretical statement? Uh, because in the previous verses, well, you talked about the practice. Yes, yes. Um, that's what I tried to explain at the beginning. That is, from from Bhagwan is Upadeshundi is a very carefully structured. Uh, work so in a in a sense we can say up to twenty three he reaches a well even at, at verse twenty he reaches a conclusion that is when 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 ego dies 
what shines forth as I am I, that is the infinite whole. That is, he could have stopped there. But the, the, what he said after that is, firstly, in, in verse 21, he drew the, he, he, he pointed out but what I always refer to, even now we're referring to ourselves as I, now we, though we are referring to this body as I, if we consider deeply what we, what is it we experience as I, it is, it is not just this body, it's the awareness in this body, that which is aware of itself as I am this body. So, uh, but what, so what I actually refers to, even when we are mistaking ourselves to be a body, is uh, is essentially only that fundamental awareness I am. That is the implication there. So he first he first he clarifies what what uh, what I actually is. It's nothing but that uh, that um, that pure awareness, that infinite whole. Then he says what I is not. That is none of these five sheaths are I. Because they're Jadra uh, right. and they're Sat, and I is Sat and Chit. So the five sheaths are not I. So what am I? I'm nothing but that Sat Chit. That's verse uh, 23. He, he, that is, there's no awareness other than what exists to know what exists. So what exists is awareness. And what is it? What is that awareness that exists? It is only ourself. Unave na mai ulam. That is, it's nothing other than ourself. So he, but then he, as I said, so all these, they, they, these are, we can say he's tying up loose ends from verse 21 onwards. He's tying mm. up many loose ends. So from in 24, in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a follow on to, since I, what I actually is, is only such it. Therefore, in our nature as such it, God and soul are one substance. That one substance is itself satchit. So um, he, he, he's tying up loose ends here, and he's also he's connecting, that is, indirectly, he's connecting back to what he said in the earlier verses. In, in verse 8, he said, of all, um, the, the best of all is to take God as not other than ourself. But he doesn't give any philosophical argument in support of that statement. That's what he says there. That will be acceptable to only to people who are ready to accept the principle of Advaita. But right. if here he's, he's giving a reason why, why we should, uh, why uh, God and soul are ultimately just one. That is, a, a substance is only one. God is the only substance. God, God means I am, that is the only substance. So ego is that substance mixed with adjuncts. Right. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Satya... And also, as I say, this is also this 24, that is the purpose of 24 is 25. Yes, is, yes, uh, yeah. what, what 24 is leading to is 25, right. in which right. he says, since the only difference is adjunct, is the adjunct awareness, therefore, knowing oneself without adjuncts is knowing God. And, oh, that's another reason I could have given when I talked about Upadi Unavu, that it is some type that some people interpret as, as adjunct and awareness. If if Bhagavan had meant there two things, adjunct and awareness, why in the next verse, verse 25, does he say, seeing oneself without adjuncts is seeing God? He should have said, seeing oneself without adjuncts and without Unavu is seeing God. But that, so it, it clearly, that, that's another indication of what, but Bhagavan wasn't talking about two things there. He wasn't talking about Upadi and Unavu as if they're two different things. He was talking about Upadi Unavu, awareness of adjuncts, adjunct awareness. Because adjuncts and our awareness of them are one and the same thing. So seeing ourselves without adjuncts is seeing God. Right. So 25 is another proof um, that Upadi. Upadi Unaru is just adjunct one, one, one entity. Is well, it's, it's not, I wouldn't exactly say it's a proof. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is 
it, it strongly indicates that that is that the intention of Bhagavan when he spoke about Upadi Unibu was not to talk about two things, but to talk about one thing. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'll look, uh, then, nothing can be proved, but we have to we have to we have to be intelligent in and discriminating in drawing inferences and interpreting these things, because anything when words can be interpreted in different ways. So when 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 we read anything or when we talk, when we when you're saying something to me. You're saying with some intention, I am interpreting what is your meaning, what is your intention. So if, if I give a different interpretation to your words, to the meaning that you intended, we are not communicating. Because you're, you're trying to convey one thing and I'm taking a different meaning from it. So when words, we are always, we are always interpreting words and words don't have fixed meanings. That is the same word can have different meanings and different implications in different contexts. So language is a means of communication. It, it, it in, that, that is when we express ourselves in language, we are, tr we are using words to try and convey a meaning or a feeling or a, well, something we are trying to convey. And the, the person who, who hears or reads our words then has to interpret it to try to understand what 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 is the meaning we're trying to convey. So um, any words can be it can be wrongly interpreted. So we, when we when we read Bhagavan's words, we need see how, in how many ways people have misinterpreted Bhagavan's words. In, in the sixth paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan says, "If our thoughts uh, uh, arise." Instead of uh, instead of following those thoughts, one should keenly investigate to whom they arise. If one keenly investigates to whom, it will be clear to me. If one investigates who am I, the mind will return to its birthplace, and the thought that it is will subside. How do what what he's referring to there has been misinterpreted by people. People think, oh, Bhagavan says that. I should wait for the next thought to pop up, and as soon as the next thought pops up, I should ask, to whom is this thought? It's to me. Then who am I? And they take it as questioning. That is not what Bhagavan meant there. Bhagavan didn't talk about questioning who, uh, to whom. Mm -hmm. or he said, if one investigates. So any Bhagavan's words are very, very deep and subtle, but very powerful pointers he's given us. But if... if Unless we understand the intention behind his words, we can misinterpret them. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we need to be very, very careful with that. That's why mere sravana is not sufficient. Sravana and manana is necessary. Manana is said to be much more powerful than sravana because by sravana we just hear the words. By manana we we we. Uh, we are able to draw out the meaning, we are able to interpret the words and to draw out the implied, not only the, we can, uh, we can draw out, we can understand what the words correctly mean and also what they imply. But even manana is not sufficient because to, to really uh, do the manana correctly and interpret correctly the words, we need to have practical, we need to have, Put it into practice. The more we put it into practice, the more clarity we will get to understand and interpret those words correctly. So we cannot even the uh, the sravana is inadequate without manana, and the manana, manana is inadequate without the nidityasana, the actual practice. Right. And the more we put it into practice, the more we're able to get from the sravana. The more meaning we're able to see in the words. And therefore, our manana is able to go deeper. And therefore, our nidhi jasana is able to go deeper. So these are all they all closely interconnected. Right. So many people write to me, uh, 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 expressing their inability to practice self-investigation. They just don't get it. And it's all a matter of understanding. If we under Bowen, Bowen said that this. It, this practice cannot be adequately expressed in words. 
because, because this is not objective. As Bhagavan said, if the way were objective, it could be explained objectively. But this is not objective, it's subjective. So Bhagavan, what Bhagavan's words are pointers. We need to think very deeply about his, uh, these pointers and understand them correctly. Then only we can put them into practice. Most people who have difficulty putting self-investigation into practice is because they have because they have not understood correctly what Bhagavan is saying. For example, I, I, earlier this afternoon I was replying to an email. Someone had written to me when I um, when I look for the eye. I'm unable to find um, it or its source, as if the, so. I had to explain to him. See, see what you think deeply about what you've written here. You say I am unable to find I. So are there then two eyes? It's one eye looking for another eye. So unless unless we understand Bhagavan uh, correctly, we won't be able to put it into practice. And unless we put it into practice, we won't be able to understand it correctly. That that isn't a catch twenty two situation. That is the more we we need to have a certain a certain level of understanding in order to begin the practice. The more we go into the practice, the more our understanding will deepen, and the more we'll then be able to understand. We'll be able to get more clarity from the words of Bhagavan, and we'll be able to apply it deeper in practice. So understanding is absolutely key to this practice. And that's kind of my, been my personal experience too, you know, that the more we practice, it, it just gives more meaning. The same text yeah, that we were yeah, doing before. Exactly, exactly. Uh, gives more and more meaning. That's I, I, I have been studying Nana, Uludunapu, Pradesh Undia, Arunachas Tuchpanchikam, these things for 45 years now. And I'm still learning more from them. It's not that I'm. It's not that I'm getting more information from them. But I'm getting more clarity from them. I'm seeing. I'm seeing greater depth of meaning in the very simple words that Bhagavan has used. Right. Um, and the implications so become clearer and clearer, and the connections between what he says here and what he says there. But it all becomes. It all. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Slowly, slowly, <laughs> all the pieces fall into place. Except that's a very crude example because jigsaw puzzle is a very gross thing. This is a very subtle thing, but it it, it does it, everything ties together so nicely. Good, thank you, Michael. The practice uh, is the absolute key. Without practice, we we cannot understand Bhagavan correctly. Right, I think you nailed it there. To to the extent we've gone deep into the practice, to that extent we'll be able to understand Bhagavan deeply. And Bhagavan is very, very deep. <laughs> However deep we go, he is still deeper. And eventually, if we'll go so deep, we'll be swallowed by him. Exactly. Um, Satya Chilakuri, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, please? <coughs> um, uh, I have been uh, hearing the same thing for quite some time, but... Uh, one makes a self-analysis and finds out uh, and gets rid of the false ego, then he's uh, Atman or Brahman, and uh, same as God. But God is not just one Jiva or one Brahman. Like, forest is not one tree. Jiva is one tree, whereas Ishwara is like a Forest, uh, if I can use that uh, metaphor. And second, uh, Atman, even if we realize and recognize that uh, we get rid of the false ego, still we are limited, even though it appears as if we can uh, assume or uh, imagine that we are limitless, but still we are limited. How can we get rid of that limitless, uh, limited? Uh, nature. The root of all limitation is ego, because the nature of ego, ego rises and grasps forms, and, uh, a form as itself. All forms are limited, but ego itself is a formless phantom, but it cannot stand without grasping form. So if ego, instead of 
trying to grasp forms as we're doing all the time. If we try to grasp ourselves, in other words, if we are self-attentive, ego will thereby subside and dissolve back into its source. And with the dissolution of ego comes the dissolution of all limitations. Limitations are there. Limitations are all adjuncts. If we see ourselves without adjuncts, there are no limitations. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And, um, and, and about God, yes, the, that is often uh, Ishwara is distinguished from Brahman. Uh, though Brahman is what God Ishwara essentially is, uh, often in um, in more traditional Vedanta, they say Brahman plus Maya is Ishwara. Um, uh, but all the difference between Brahman and Ishwara is only in our view. In, in the view of Ishwara, Ishwara is aware of itself only as I am, because Ishwara is nothing but Brahman. It's only from our perspective that God seems to be, because we have, we have by limiting ourselves, we seem to have separated ourselves from our real nature. So the, the, the part of our real nature from which we've limited us, we, from which we've uh, separated ourselves, we call that Ishwara. So God also seems to have limitations. Though we say God is infinite, all our ideas about God are finite ideas. So, so, we, so long as we experience ourselves as finite, we cannot but see God as finite, as limited. That, that is why Bhagavan says in verse 4 of Uruginapadu, if one's self is a form, the world and God will be likewise. So we are li by, by limiting ourselves, we are there by limiting God. Because when we go take God to be something other than ourselves, if he's other than ourselves, then he's limited. Because if, if there cannot be anything, if God is truly infinite, nothing can be other than him. If we are, if we, if we are actually something separate from God, as we now seem to be, God therefore seems to be something separate from ourselves. So God seems to be something limited, even though we say, "Oh, God is infinite, God is unlimited." We, our conception of Him, even our conception of it, of infinitude, of unlimitedness, is is a limited conception. So to know God as He is. There's only one way, as Bhagavan says in the next verse, seeing oneself without seeing, without adjuncts, is itself seen, or knowing oneself without adjuncts is itself knowing God. So, so long as we are aware of ourselves with adjuncts, we cannot know God as he is. That's why Bhagavan says in verse, um, uh, I think verse uh, 20 of, uh, of, of Ulujanabdu, leaving oneself, seeing God, is seeing only a manamaya man kakshi, is seeing only a mental, um, a mental sight, a mental vision. So to know God as he, act, as he actually is, as, um, as he says in the end, so how do, can we know God? Unadal Khan. Oh, that's in the next verse, he says, Unadal Khan. In verse 20, um, of Ulujanapati Bhagavan says, um, leaving oneself who sees, oneself seeing God is seeing only a manamaya maam a mental vision. Only one who sees oneself, the origin of oneself, is one who has seen God, because uh, it's a very, Bhagavan has put it very tasty, but with the origin of oneself going, oneself is not other than God. And then in verse 21, he concludes, um, he concludes how to see God, becoming food is seen. How is oneself to see oneself? How is oneself to see, how to see God? Becoming food is seen. So only when we are completely swallowed by him are we truly seeing him. And how to be swallowed by him? To see ourselves without adjuncts. We will thereby be swallowed by him. So, um, so, um, Michael, um, can during practice, um, because 
um, we know that the Upadhyatra state is actually what we really are. Yes. Um, can, you know, when you're trying to practice Atma Vichara, can we sort of act out, start with the, like, okay, I am I'm actually awareness itself and to just focus right there on the awareness. Um, and, and then you realize that you're really not acting out because then that you really are that. I mean, just as a, as a start, at a starting point, you know, for the practice. Our, our aim is not to, that is the more traditional approach is, but we should, we should meditate. I am Brahman, or I am consciousness, or I am a, a pure awareness. Bhagavan doesn't recommend that. He said that may be an aid, but it's not vichara. Vichara is only investigating ourselves. So let's not have any preconceptions about what we are. We are aware I am. So what is this I? Who am I? Our aim is just to investigate I with, so we need not have any, any preconception. Of course, we need to have understanding. We need to have understanding, but we are not any of these five sheets. We are just the awareness. Awareness means the awareness I am. But what we are to, we, we, we shouldn't, um, we, sh we, we shouldn't allow our mind to dwell on ideas about what we are, but I am Brahman or I am, Awareness, because these are just ideas. It's not actually our experience, but we are we are pure awareness. Our experience is that we are awareness mixed up with this uh, with these five sheaves. So to merely to think I am pure awareness, it may be an aid, but it's not. It's not the actual investigation. The actual investigation is just to try to be keenly self-attentive, to attend ever more keenly to. Who am I to what this I actually is? Right. Um, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question. Have I answered it correctly, or, um, or were you asking something slightly different? I think I think you did. Um, so uh, that's the point I want to bring out. Like, you know, this really don't want any concepts, but if there is um I think I'm just basically reframing focus on awareness itself. Yes. Um, so rather than even have a concept that you're we have, to un we have to have an understanding, but we are not any object. Right. We are the awareness to which all objects appear. Uh, superficially, because what the awareness to which all objects appear is only ego, but that's sufficient for us to start with. To whom are all these objects? We turn our attention back to ourselves. Then we go but by turn, the more we turn our attention towards ourselves, I means I mean, just towards this fundamental awareness I am, the adjuncts drop off and uh, ego is thereby uh, dissolved back into its source. It becomes food. Right. Um, so let me uh, go to the next question here. Um, Umberto, do you, uh, do you want to ask that comment? Is a comment is more common than a question, but you can go ahead. Umberto? Uh, yeah. Actually, um, no, I, what I was saying was trying to reply to Satya regarding the difference between uh, uh, Brahman and Ishvara. So I think uh, Michael has already uh, answered that very clearly. So, so but uh, I want to read what you said there. As I understand it, Ishvara and Brahma, within parentheses, not Brahman, are one and the same. Um, but I think that needs some clarification from Michael, so I'll let him. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, first, yes, right, we, we, we okay. need to un we need to understand um, um, Brahma, the the creator, is different. Is um, there are two words? Brahman is is referring to is a um, is an impersonal noun referring to uh, the, uh, our real nature. Our real nature is Brahman. Brahma is, is the create... Uh, God is considered to have um, uh, various divine functions. The first three functions of God are, are creation, sustenance, and destruction. The God who's responsible for creation is Brahma. 
with God who's responsible for sustenance is Vishnu, and with God who's responsible for uh, destruction or dissolution is Shiva. Um, this is this really has nothing to do, well. The, this this is um, for for people who think that the world that who 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 believe in the create that God has created this world. All this is applicable, but according to Bhagavan, what has created this world is only ego. Um, it's only when we rise as ego that the world appears. So, um, uh, so Brahma as the creator is is um, is not um, that Ishwara is a term that includes all through all the functions. The creation, sustenance, and destruction, according to certain views. But from our point of view, from Bhagavan's, from the point of view of Bhagavan's teaching, we need not attribute to Ishwara this creation, sustenance, and destruction. The world is created by our rising as ego. It's sustained by our continuing to stand as ego, and it's dissolved by our subsiding back into our source. So, very, as I say, there are many, many different levels of teaching which are given to suit people of different levels of understanding. Um, so, Brahma, we need not be concerned about at all. Uh, Brahman, even Brahman, we need not really be concerned about because. What is Brahman? Brahman is nothing but I. You are that. When you know what is the purpose of a Mahavakya that says Tatvamasi, you are that. Till now we've been taking Brahman to be something other than ourselves, and we've been seeking Brahman outside ourselves. The Upanishads tell us you are that. What is the practical implication of that? Oh, all this time I've been looking for Brahman outside. But if I myself am Brahman, then I should stop looking outside. I should look only at myself. That is what we should understand the, the practical implication of that um, of that uh, Mahavakya. All, all the Mahavakyas are all pointing in the same direction. They're all indicating that Brahman is nothing but I am. So we we have to turn our attention back towards ourselves. That is the practical implication of a Mahavakya. But people miss miss. Uh, that if they fail to uh, grasp the practical implication and they begin philosophizing about it and explaining it. And um, there are some people who even say it's not sufficient just to investigate the tvum pada, the word tvum, you also have to investigate the, the uh, tat pada, the, the word tat, as if they're two different things. The whole purpose of the Mahavakya view of that is to say, that is nothing other than you. So stop investigating other things. Investigate only yourself. So Thank you very much. Things, there are so many different levels of teachings are given to suit people different level uh, people of different uh, levels of uh, spiritual development, and also inevitably people of different levels of spiritual development interpret the same thing in different ways. So we, we need to understand Bhagavan has given us Advaita in its most refined and purest form. So we need to we need to cling firmly to Bhagavan's teachings and go deep into his teachings to understand what he's actually saying. And we understand it most effectively by trying to put it into practice. Thank you very much, Michael. Amazing, amazing answer. Thank you very much. Very, very, very grateful. Really, I mean, you're like people say you're you're shaking the rattle. <laughs> well, it's not me. Thank it's you. Bhagavan. <laughs> Bhagavan is. Oh, we we all come to Bhagavan with so many beliefs. We come believing I am this body and uh, this world is real and everything. Bhagavan shakes whatever we believe. Bhagavan and. Uh, um, cuts the ground from under our feet. But we must be willing to let go of all our previous ideas and conceptions in order to go deep into Bhagavan's teaching. So long as we continue clinging to our old ideas and trying to understand Bhagavan's teachings in terms of our old ideas, we won't understand Bhagavan's teachings in their, in their naked and simplicity and purity. We've got to first 
wipe our mind, the slate of our mind has to be wiped clean, clean, and then only Bhagavan teachings will make a real impression, a deep impression upon us. Michael, uh, this is Stephen. Um, that, that's really powerful what you just said. Uh, what I got from that is that the, I guess, the joy in my understanding is part of my listening, my willingness to let go and listen. Yes. So when you say something profound, it's because I'm listening profoundly. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for this. This was, this was, yeah. um, thank you for your delivery, yeah. not for what you delivered. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not me. It's all Bhagavan. It's all Bhagavan. Bhagavan is yeah, and that's what I wanted station. to say. With, <laughs> yeah. You're the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. You're a messenger in my, yeah, in my book. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Bhagavan, um, is, Bhagavan is transmitting the radio signal very clearly. But if our radio set is not a, a sensitive, uh, well-tuned uh, receiver, we will not be. We'll be hearing a lot of crackling sound, and we won't be clearly grasping what is uh, what is being said. So, the, thank you. We, we need to focus on the receiver. And, thank are, you. are we receiving it correctly? So, who is this? Who am I? The receiver of all hmm. this. The more we investigate the receiver, the more the receiver will become finely tuned to re receive uh, correctly the, uh, the, the messages being transmitted by the, through the radio waves. <laughs> That's an awesome analogy. Thank you. <laughs> no. Thank you, Bhagavan. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. right. That you've understood now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I am nothing. It's all Bhagavan. If it's... That is, whatever I say, it is useful to the extent that it is, it is um, conveying what Bhagavan said and what Bhagavan intended to mean. It's useful only to that extent. It's, it's got nothing to do with Michael, because Michael is just, just a, a, a nobody. But it's because it comes from Bhagavan. If there's anything useful in anything I say, it is only because it's come from Bhagavan, not because it comes from me. Thank you, Michael. Um, Rabbi, do you want to go next with your question? Rabbi Day. Sure. Um, Michael, um, as you have mentioned several times, the path of Yana and Advaita consists of uh, Shravana, Manuna, Nididhyasana. Now, Shravana is easy to understand. Uh, we bring ourselves to listening to you and or read Bhagavan's work, uh, and that leads to sometime a state of being or get a glimpse of your own being. And Nididhyasana is a step forward where you are aware of your existence or attentively self-aware, as you say. Now, Manana is a sort of uh, um, sort of straddles these two activities, uh, Shravana and Nididhyasana. And in my mind, of course, I'm seeking clarification from you right now, is an aspect of Manana. But uh, when I am reading something by myself or taking a walk and think, thinking, so what does Manana consist of if if uh, I'm not uh, attentively self-aware, like Nidhyasana. So can you distinguish uh, the subtlety um, between Manana and Nidhyasana? That is, in simple terms, that is the, the Sravana is the reading and the, um, and the, or, or listening to, to Bhagavan's teachings. But when we, when we listen, we, we, as soon as we listen to something, we begin to interpret it. We begin to, uh, and we, we, we try to fit it into our understanding. So, so sravana automatically leads to manana, but our manana needs to be very deep and very careful because when we first hear Bhagavan's teachings, 
we understand the meaning superficially, but a mere superficial understanding is insufficient. We need to have a deep and clear understanding. That deep and clear understanding, manana plays an important role in that. That is, we need to think deeply about it. We need to see the connections. We need to, we, we need to, we, we, that is, in, in sravana, we are receiving the words. Whereas in manana, we are trying to see what lies behind the words. What is, the, what, is, what is it Bhagavan is conveying by these words? So we think about it very deeply and carefully. And then nidityasana means actually putting it into practice, turning our attention back to face ourselves. But though these are three, we, we can explain that there are three distinct things, the distinction is actually not so clear because if we are doing sravana correctly, when, for example, we hear tatvamasi, where should our attention turn? Our attention should turn, or oh, if that is I, then our attention should turn back to I. So when we are, if we, and particularly with Bhagavan's teachings, Bhagavan's teachings are all about practice and all about I. The, the, the practice is only attending to I. So that is Bhagavan's words themselves should merely listening to or reading Bhagavan's words should turn our attention back towards ourselves. So they, they, the, the sravana should lead directly to nidityasana. And even more so with manana. When we are thinking deeply about Bhagavan's words, what are all of Bhagavan's words pointing at? They're pointing only at I. So our attention should be turning back to I. So if we are doing the sravana correctly, we'll be doing nidityasana along with it. If we're doing manana correctly, even more we'll be doing nidityasana along with it. So, so there's no hard and fast uh, dividing line. That is, the whole purpose of Bhagavan's words is to turn our attention back to ourselves. So if we're really listening correctly to what Bhagavan is saying, we'll be turning our attention back to ourselves. And if we're really thinking deeply about it, we'll be turning our attention back to ourselves. Thank you, Michael. That, uh, this is such a great ex explanation. Yes, I think yes. the whole uh, essence is turning yes. inwards, yes. turning towards I, yes, yes. and uh, these are all um, aids to that yes, yes, central yes. idea. Thank exactly. you so much. That, that is the whole, the whole purpose of everything, the whole purpose of Bhagavan's teachings, whatever he's taught, we, that is, whatever we read of, of what Bhagavan is, and I'm not talking about the answers he gave in talks and such books, because often he had to dilute his teaching to suit people. And often in those books, things aren't recorded very clearly. What Bhagavan actually said, um, his actual words were not, um, that is, the people who recorded those books, they, they recorded what they understood, which may not always be correct, um, and what they could remember. So their memory may not always be correct. But when, as far as Bhagavan's original works are concerned, what Bhagavan himself wrote, Nana, Upadesh Undiya, Uludun Apadu, Aranatra Stuti Panchakam, Atma Big Day, Ekama Panchakam, such works, we, we need to, we, when we read them, we need to, we, part of the mana, manana is understanding the practical implication of whatever Bhagavan said. So whatever, Bhagavan, whatever some of Bhagavan teaching, people say, oh, I'm not interested in the theoretical teachings, I'm only interested in the practice. All of Bhagavan's teachings, the whole theory, it's all about practice. That is, there's practical implication to whatever Bhagavan has said. So if we want to understand Bhagavan correctly, we need to consider what is the practical implication of this? Why did Bhagavan say like this? How can I apply this in practice? That's, an, that's, the, that's the most important part of manana. It's understanding the practical implications of what we've heard from Sravana. And of course, the practical, what the practical implications, I mean, it's all turning our, in one way or other, Bhagavan is turning our attention back towards ourselves. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Ravi. Um, so, um, Anand, do you, do you have a question or a comment? Mm -hmm. It's a final question. All right. 
uh, it's both. Um, I was thinking of uh, the necessity or the need for Ishvara for um, self inquiry sadhaka. That is, the scriptures uh, describe Ishvara as a reflected consciousness from the Brahman and that talk about two forms, the Virat Swarupa and the Visharupa, etc. You know, uh, the origin of all the five kosha, koshas being you know, the Ishvara himself. So for um, this is all only when we consider the world to be real, the outside world that we perceive through senses and mind, intellect. When they are real, the Ishvara is also real or simply needed. Whereas Guru, you know, is more direct, you know, you can relate to the Guru uh, and we do need a Guru in, in your form or in Bhagavan's form. No, not in my form. I'm not Guru. Okay, Bhagavan so, alone is Guru. Mind you, it's one and the same. When I say you and Bhagavan, you know, there's no distinction. And I am not distinct from you also, except I am real. Yeah, so the cons, you know, why do we need Isha? Why do, in general, in general people have to have a, a, a formed, uh, you know, whether it is Hindu religion or any religion, where is the need for God when, uh, you know, we cannot ask that because uh, that will be, yeah, from their perspective, they need it. But from a, from a other perspective, do we need to still hang on to Ishvara, like, uh, you know, the concept of Santa Claus remaining only up to a point and you realize that Santa Claus is only a principle. Uh, in, the, in the first sentence of the 12th paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan says, um, Kadavalam Guruvam Unmail Verala. So, having come to Guru, Ishwara is unnecessary. That is, Ishwara is nothing other than Guru. So for us, Bhagavan is God, Guru, and our own real self. He is everything. So we don't need any God other than Bhagavan. Um, regarding what you were saying earlier about, um, about Virat and um, uh, all the five elements and five sheaves and so many things, as Bhagavan explained, there are different different levels of uh, of teachings are given within Advaita. The ultimate truth is Ajata, but there is no appearance at all. There is only what exists is only Brahman or only ourself. Nothing else exists at all. That is the ultimate truth according to Bhagavan. But merely teaching Ajata is not useful because Ajata denies that there's any problem at all. So if you go to a doctor and uh, with, um, with some disease and the doctor tells you you have no disease at all, you can go home, that's not very useful. You, the doctor needs to recognize, even if your disease is purely psychological, the doctor has to acknowledge, yes, you, you are really feeling pain. It may be entirely psychological, but you're feeling the pain. So the doctor has to give you some solution for, for your problem, or that he's a useless doctor. So Guru doesn't, though, though Bhagavan tells us the ultimate truth is Ajata, that it, it, it's, it's very useful to understand, but ultimately none of this exists at all. But Bhagavan, in order to give us useful teaching, he, ha he acknowledges that there's a problem. So he begins with Udunapadu, Na Molahum Kandalal, because we see the world. So he's, uh, he stepped down from Ajata, because in Ajata there's no we, there's no world, there's only, well, there's only we, but not the we who sees the world. So Na Molahum Kandalal, those words are very deep. Yes. Who is that Nam who sees the world? Who is that we who see the world? It is only ego. The, because we have, so the implication is because we have risen as ego and therefore are seeing the world, there is a problem. So the whole of Uludu Napadu is, is uh, analyzing what this problem is. A problem, the world is not a problem. 
The problem is the we who see the world. So Bhagavan starts off with the problem, with this we. That is not we as we actually are, but we as the seer of the world are a problem. So, so Bhagavan acknowledges the problem. But what Bhagavan says about the problem, why do we, why does the world appear? Because we see it. It doesn't actually exist independent of our seeing it. So Bhagavan, what Bhagavan teaches is in Uldi Dunapli and elsewhere is what is called Drishti Shishti Vada. That is, but there's no creation independent of our perception of it, just like in a dream. In a dream, we, we see a dream world. The dream world, that dream world seems to exist independent, or we assume that it exists independent of our perception of it. So this world was created long before we were born, and it's going to be there long after we die. And even when we go to sleep, it will still be there. That's our, our assumption while we're dreaming. But actually, that dream world, what brought that dream world into existence? Only our seeing it. If we didn't see it, it wouldn't exist at all. So there's no, uh, there's no uh, creation independent of perception. That is, uh, whatever seems to exist, it seems to exist only in the view of ego. This is Bhagavan's teaching. This is the most useful and practical teaching. It, firstly, it's the simplest explanation. For the appearance of all this multiplicity is all just a dream. So, and also has uh, contains within it the solution, because the the dream exists only in the view of the dreamer. So the problem is not the dream, but the dreamer. So the dreamer is nothing but ego. What is ego? Ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. So, in order to eradicate ego, we need to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. So, within Drishti Shrishti Vada, the, as it's taught by Bhagavan, the, the, uh, the solution is implied there. Uh, the world appears because we've risen as ego. Ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. So in order to eradicate, in order to get rid of the world appearance, we need to get rid of ego. In order to get rid of ego, we need to see ourselves as we actually are, be aware of ourselves as we actually are. So we need to investigate ourselves. So the, the, the most practical uh, form of Advaita is Drishti Shrishti Vada. That is what Bhagavan has taught us. And he's explained it more clearly than it has ever been explained before. Nobody before Bhagavan has analyzed that the root problem is ego. In older texts, it was said the root problem is avidya, ignorance. Bhagavan doesn't disagree with that, but he says, for whom is avidya? Avidya is only for ego. In fact, uh, there is no avidya other than ego. Avidya is the very nature of ego, because the ego is the false awareness, I am this body. That is avidya. So, for Bhagavan, avidya is nothing but ego. But so long as we talk of avidya, it sounds like something other than ourselves. Okay, avidya is a problem. How do we get rid of this problem, avidya? We're trying to get rid of something other than ourselves. Bhagavan has said, no, that avidya is nothing other than you. You yourself are that avidya. <laughs> so to get rid of avidya, you need to see yourself as you actually are. So Bhagavan's teachings has, has made Advaita so, so practical. But, but for most people, this, who um, this idea of the whole world is a, a, a dream is not palatable. So when Shankara wrote his commentaries on the uh, on the um, on the Prasthana Treya, on the uh, Upanishad, the Brahma Sutra, and Bhagavad Gita. He, he had come with a divine mission to establish that Advaita is the true interpretation of Vedanta, which is the essence of uh, the Vedas. So the, the ultimate import of the Vedas is Advaita. That was what Shankara was to establish. And he had to argue with so many other uh, followers of so many other systems of philosophy. So Shankara presented Advaita in a way that would be palatable to a greater number of people. So Shank most of Shankara's commentaries were written from the Shrishti Drishti perspective. Shankara also 
for example, Godapada, Godapada, though the, the, the word, the, these terms, Shristi, Drishti, and Drishti, Shristi, these were coined a thousand years later. I mean, they were coined only in the 15th or 16th century by someone called Prakasananda. But actually, what, what uh, Godapada clearly taught in the Mandukya Karaka is Drishti Shristi Bada, because he, he argues that, that there's no difference between waking and dream. So when Shankara wrote commentary on, uh, on uh, the Mandukya Karaka, well, he wrote on the Mandukya Upanishad and Karaka together, he, he was then uh, arguing from the perspective of Drishti Shristi Bada, but on most of the other Upanishads, his commentaries are more veering towards uh, Shish, uh, Shishti Jishi Bada, because that is what is suitable for the majority of people. But the problem with Shishti Jishi Bada, it's not practical. Because you're saying the problem is not, I am not the problem. The problem is God has created this world, and, but, and then there's this thing, Abhidya, which is something somehow, um, uh, Brahman mixed with uh, Maya is, uh, um, is, is Ishwara, and Brahman mixed with Avidya is Jiva. So I've got to get rid of this, G, this Avidya in order to become Brahman. It, it's, it's, that's why if you, if you study traditional uh, Advaita, it's, the vast majority of it is presented from the Shristi Drishti perspective. And the, what is the practice is not at all clear. All they say is you have to, you have to, you have to study all these texts. You have to understand them, and you have to dwell on that truth. You have to dwell on the truth that you are not the body; you are Brahman. But that yeah. is not the practice. The practice is when you've understood what the import of all the, the ultimate import of all the Upanishads is summarized in the Mahavakyas: Aham Brahmasmi, Tatvamasi, Ayamatma Brahman. Uh, um, uh, Pragnanam Brahman. All these are pointing to the fact that you yourself are Brahman. So since you yourself are Brahman, how to know Brahman? You must know yourself. You must investigate yourself. So stop looking for Brahman outside. Stop looking for the truth outside. Stop looking for happiness outside. Turn your attention within. That is the true import of the Mahavakyas. That is completely missed by most of the people who explain these uh, who explain Shankara's commentary and so on. It's completely missed. But, but so Bhagavan has made it so, so clear. What is the actual practice? In fact, the sole purpose of Bhagavan's teaching was to, to represent, to, to, to present a Dvaita, the same, the same truth Bhagavan is presenting, but in a very simple and refined manner, and most importantly, in a very practical manner. All of Bhagavan's teachings have practical implications. Bhagavan wasn't concerned about, Bhagavan did teach very deep and profound philosophy, but his aim wasn't, he wasn't teaching philosophy for the sake of philosophy. Bhagavan didn't ask us to go out and quarrel with other schools of thought. In fact, Bhagavan condemns that. In verses two and three of Uludun Afdu, Bhagavan makes it very, very clear. The aim of, the, of his teachings is not to go and quarrel with others. It's not to go and say the world is real or the world is unreal or it's all this. Bhagavan says, a state that is agreeable to all is a state without ego. That is what we are seeking. And Bhagavan very clear, makes very clear in verses 2 and 3 of Uludunapu that our aim is not to argue with others. Our aim is only the dissolution of our own ego. That Thank is the purpose. So yeah. everyone's teachings are wholly practical. Yeah, I yeah I really appreciate you know the time he has yeah. spent. But yeah. uh, one quick um, follow up. Uh, it, I think it's Lakshmana Sharma Surai for Ulladu Narpade. Yes, which talks about Bhagavan's own preference is what's called Ajada um, Srishti. I mean, there was there is no you know there is neither Srishti Srishti or Srishti. srishti. But it never was. It has always been. Yes. So the yes. 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 So it's Bhag Bhagavan very clearly said that is his experience, is a jata. And that yes. is the ultimate truth. 
He, Bhagavan made it very clear that that is, but he, Bhagavan also said that is not useful as a teaching. Oh, and it, it has its place in the teaching, but it, uh, Jaka itself denies that there's any problem. So when you deny there's any problem, you, 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 there's also no solution to the problem. So Bhagavan comes down to our level to accept there is a problem. But he says, the problem is nothing but you yourself. Uh, yes, the, the world, world seems to exist. But in whose view? To whom does all this appear? To me. So who is that I? To whom all this appears? So Bhagavan, is, Bhagavan comes down to our level. Because how to experience a jata? We cannot experience a jata without getting rid of ego. So we need to have a means to get rid of ego. When we get rid of ego, we will find there never was any ego. And therefore never was any world. Because the world appears only in the view of ego. When we investigate ego, um, there's no such thing at all. So we, we uh, uh, ultimately, that is the logical conclusion of Drishti Shrishti Vada, as taught by Bhagavan, is a jata. And it, if we apply Bhagavan's teachings in practice, Ajata is our final destination, but for, uh, it, it, because that is not our experience now. Now we, because we see the world, we have a problem. So Bhagavan gives us a solution. <laughs> Thank you again. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I think um, with regards to Anand's question, it's um, you can point out here that when Murugunar uh, requested Bhagavan. Main Yelbum are the Mevum Tiranam Uimbari Yamakuod here. Bhagwan and Bhagwan responded, there was in his first response, there was really no reference to God, the word God. Isn't that right, Michael? Yeah, yes. Well, the, um, I mean, the second Mangalam verse wasn't there in his first, first draft. Well, he, like or, origi originally, when that, that is when. Uh, but, when, when Murugan requested that, there was already some verses that, that have been composed. Oh, and, I'm sorry, uh, Michael, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just translate the oh, question yeah, for yeah, a yeah. bit of... Um, um, uh, what, what, in Murugan's Pyram, that's in his preparatory verse for Urudunapadu, he wrote what he requested Bhagavan. May in Ilbum, the nature of reality, adu mevum tiranum, and the means to attain it, um uh emiku uh, uh, odaha teach to us the nature of reality means to attain it so that the world may be saved so that we may in other words so that the you know, jivas may be saved or so we may all be saved uh, that's what Murugana uh, requested Bhagavan when they started there were some 20 verses and Bhagavan started composing new verses, and slowly, slowly, the old verses were removed. And uh, finally, I think from the original collection of 20 verses, only, um, only three of them remained in Urudunapadu. The others all got relegated and were later um, added to Urudunapadu and Bandam. So almost all the verses were composed by Bhagavan. So after Bhagavan had completed 40 verses and one Mangalam verse, that was the form in which Uludunapati was originally intended to be. And the Mangalam verse was the last two lines of the present first Mangalam verse. So um, the, Murugan and Bhagavan were satisfied with that. But Kaviyaganta, some of uh, Kaviyaganta was there at that time. So he came to hear about this, that Bhagavan had composed this work. So he asked to see it. And he he could understand, he was, a, he was, um, his mother tongue was Telugu, but he had lived a, a lot of his, a long, lot of his life in uh, Tamil Nadu. So he understood spoken Tamil, and he had a little understanding of literary Tamil, but not a very deep understanding. So when he went through it, he first noticed that the, um, the first Mangalam verse was only two lines, and all the other verses were four lines. So he said to Bhagavan, Bhagavan, why is this in a different meter? Then Bhagavan explained, this isn't a different meter. This is a Kuru member. 
a two line member. The others are, um, uh, are, are, f are full members. They, they are four line members. I think uh, Neresai member is called that, that particular type of member. Um, uh, so, um, so Kavigan said, wouldn't it be better to make this also like that? So Bhagavan and Morgan are very consulted with each other. And Bhagavan said, yes, OK, we'll, we'll, um, we'll make it into a four-line verse. So Bhagavan added the first two lines of, uh, of uh, um, that first Mangalam verse. Then Kavigant said, but how can this verse be a Mangalam? But there's no mention of God in it. A Mangalam has to be a prayer to God or some, something. God has to be connected. But this is, it doesn't mention anything. It's only Uludu, Uludu. Uh, um, of course, Uludu is the reality of God, but he's thinking in more of a theistic way. So he then went through and he found towards the end there was a verse in which Bhagavan mentioned um, Maheshwa. That is, Maranabhaya Mikku Ammakal uh, they, they take refuge in the feet of uh, Maheshwa. So uh, he said, oh, this would be a much more suitable uh, verse to have as a mangalam. Why don't you make this as a mangalam and put, this, and put the other verse somewhere else? So then again, Bhagavan and Murugan and they discussed among themselves. And then they, uh, Bhagavan decided, yes, OK, we'll make this the first mangalam verse is about uh, Atma Vichara. This is about uh, Atma Samapanam, self-surrender. Self so we'll take this as two Mangalam verses. So then Bhagavan composed another verse to make up for the missing verse from the 40s. So it ended up with four Mangalam verses. So um, in the original verse, there was Bhagavan did, in the original original uh, Bhagavan did mention um, God, but didn't mention any personal name of God. Maheshwar, just means the great God, but it's generally understood as a name of Shiva. So because it was a name of Shiva, Kavyaganta thought that should be a, a Mangalam. But of course, Uludu Napadu is not about uh, God in that sense, because God in a personal sense, as Bhagavan says, seeing God in uh, without seeing oneself is seeing only a, a, a Manamaya Mamkakshi. So Uludu Napadu is all about um, Knowing the reality of ourselves, knowing what we actually are. It's all about the name itself says Ulladu. Ulladu means what exists, what actually exists. 